Welcome to Miami Mutual Bank. How may I help you? I'd like to cash this check here, and then and I'd like to take you out for a steak dinner. <laughs> Are you a real life pilot? I sure am, little lady. The jump seat is open. It's been a while since I've done this. Which one's the jump seat again? Dr. Connors to the ER. Dr. Connors to the ER. This is irrefutable evidence that the defendant is lying. Special Agent Hanratty, FBI. Hello, Carl. You're gonna get caught. It's like Vegas. The house always wins. Some nuts flying around the country posing as a pilot. Call him the James Bond of the sky. Hello, pusher. This is by far the best date I have ever been on. He's a kid. That's why he doesn't have a record. 30 milligrams of codeine every four hours. Do you concur? I concur. Dr. Harris. Yes? Do you concur? Concur with what, sir? <laughs> Ma'am, I'm sorry to have to tell you, your son has fired your checks. I have a payroll check here I'd like to cash. I'm working part-time at the church now. Just tell me how much yours and I'll pay you back. $1.3 million. I'll be choosing eight young ladies to be a part of Pan Am's future stewardess program. South America, Australia, Singapore. These are so perfect, the bank doesn't even know the difference. What do you want? To apologize. You didn't call to apologize, did you? You have no one else to call. I'm looking for your son. I would never give up my son. If you were a father, you'd know. Stop chasing me. I can't stop. It's my job. You see these people staring at you? They keep peeking over their shoulders, wondering where you're going tonight. Where are you going, Frank? Don't tell me not to fly. I've simply got to. If someone takes a spill, it's me and not you. Don't bring around a cloud of terrain on my parade. Sir, we're going to let him get away. Oh, Carl, you let him get away. Nobody had a better brain on my Merry Christmas! Parade. I'm getting close, huh? You will go to prison. You're going to have to catch me. Ladies and gentlemen, the real Frank Abagnale. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. Normally, when I uh, walk up to a podium to speak, it's always about fraud and counterfeiting, embezzlement, and identity theft, and things of that nature. But today, I've been asked to do something a little different, and that is to talk a little bit about uh, my life, in which the film Catch Me If You Can was based. As many of you know, a book was written about my life many years ago by an author, later on made into a major motion picture by a famous movie director, then to a television show called White Collar on TV, and now to a Broadway play that's been nominated for four Tony Awards. All of the people who created those shows never met me, so I can only assume that they are telling those stories uh, based on their own point of view. So um, I thought that I would tell you the story from my point of view. I was raised just north of New York City in Westchester County, New York, in a little town called Bronxville. I was actually one of four children in the family, the so-called middle child of the four. I was educated there by the Christian Brothers of Ireland at a private Catholic school called Iona in New Rochelle, New York, where I went to school from kindergarten to high school. By the time I had reached the age of 16 in the 10th grade, my parents, after 22 years of marriage one day, decided to get a divorce. Unlike most divorces, where the children were usually the first to know, my parents were very good about keeping that a secret. I remember being in the 10th grade when the father walked into the classroom and asked a brother to excuse me from class. When I came out in the hallway, the father handed me my books and told me that one of the brothers would drive me to the county seat in White Plains, New York, where I would meet my parents and they would explain what was going on. I remember the brother dropped me at the steps of a big stone building and told me to go on up the steps and that my parents would be waiting for me in the lobby. I remember climbing the steps, seeing a sign on the building that said family court, but really didn't understand what that meant. When I arrived in the lobby, my parents were not there, but I was ushered into the back of an immense courtroom where my parents were standing before a judge. I couldn't hear what the judge was saying, nor my parents' response, but eventually the judge saw me at the back of the room and motioned me to approach the bench. I remember distinctly that the judge never looked at me, never acknowledged I was standing there. He simply read from his papers and said that my parents were getting a divorce. And because I was 16 years of age, I would need to tell the court which parent. I chose to live with. 
I started to cry, so I turned and ran out of the courtroom. The judge called for a 10-minute recess. By the time my parents got outside, I was gone. My mother never saw me again for about seven years until I was a young adult. Contrary to the movie, my father never saw me nor ever spoke to me again. In the mid-1960s, running away was a very popular thing for young people. A lot of them got caught up in Haight-Ashbury, the hippie scene, the drug scene. Instead, I took a few belongings from my home, packed them in a bag, boarded what was then the New Haven and Hartford Railroad for a short train ride down to Grand Central Terminal in New York. My father did own a stationery store, but actually in Manhattan, located on the corner of 40th and Madison. Like all of us, we had to work in that store, so I made deliveries for my dad. I knew the city very well, so naturally I started looking for the same type of work. There were a lot of signs in the windows, stock boy, delivery boy. I'd walk in and apply. So tell me, young man, how old are you? 16. How far did you go in high school? 10th grade. I'll hire you. And I went to work for a small amount of money, a few hours a day, but I soon realized I couldn't support myself on that amount of money. I also realized that as long as people believed I was 16 years old, they weren't going to pay me any more money. At 16, I was six foot tall. I've always had little gray hair. My friends in school used to say that once a week when we dress for mass, I look more like a teacher than a student. So I decided to lie about my age. In New York, we had a driver's license at 16. Back then, it didn't have a photo on it, just an IBM card. So I altered one digit from my date of birth. I was actually born in April of 1948, but I dropped the four, converted it to a three, and that made me 10 years older or 26 years old. I walked around applying for the same type of work. People gave me a little more money, a few more hours, but even then it was difficult to make ends meet. One of the few things I had taken when I left home was a checkbook. My father had opened a checking account for me at a small community bank in Mount Vernon, New York. Had a little money in the account, so every so often I would write a check to supplement my income. $10, $15, funds were there, checks were good. But it was my friends, my peers, who would say to me, you know, you're the only guy I know goes into a bank in the middle of Manhattan. You have no account there. You don't know a soul. You just talk to somebody behind a desk and they okay your check. Oh, well, my checks are good. If I walked in that bank, they wouldn't touch my check. You walk in, they don't bat an eye. Years later, reporters would say that that was my upbringing, mannerisms, dress, appearance, whatever it was, it was very easy to do, so consequently, when the money ran out, I kept writing those checks. Of course, the checks started to bounce. Police were looking for me as a runaway, so I thought maybe it was a good time to start thinking about leaving New York City. But I was quite apprehensive about going to Chicago or Miami. I wondered if they'd cash a New York check on a New York driver's license as quickly as they did in Manhattan. I was walking up 42nd Street one afternoon about 5 o'clock in the evening, 16 years old, pondering all of these things when I started to approach the front door of an old hotel that used to be there called the Commodore Hotel, now the Grand Hyatt. Just as I was about to get to the front door of the hotel, out stepped an Eastern Airline flight crew onto the sidewalk. I couldn't help but notice the captain, the co-pilot, the flight engineer, about three or four flight attendants dragging their bags to the curb to load them in the van to take them to the airport. As they were loading the van, I thought to myself, that's it. If I could pose as a pilot, I could travel all over the world for free. I could probably get just about anybody, anywhere to cash a check for me. So I walked up the street a little further to 42nd and Park. I went to cross over. I heard a huge helicopter, so I looked up, and there was New York Airways landing on the roof of the Pan Am building. Pan Am, the nation's flag carrier, the airline that flew around the world. I thought, what a perfect airline to use. So the next day, I placed a phone call to the executive corporate offices of Pan Am. When the switchboard was ringing, I had absolutely no idea what I was going to say. When they answered, Pan American Airlines, good morning, can I help you? Uh, yes, ma'am. I'd like to speak to somebody in, the, um, somebody in the purchasing department. Purchasing? One moment. And the clerk came on. I said, yes, sir, maybe you can help me. My name is um, John Black. I'm a co-pilot with a company based out of San Francisco, been with the company about seven years, never had anything like this come up before. What's the problem? Well, we flew a trip in here yesterday, going out today. Yesterday I sent my uniform out through the hotel to have it dry cleaned. Now the hotel and the cleaner say they can't find it. Hey, I'm with a flight in about four hours, no uniform. Don't you have a spare uniform? Certainly. Back home in San Francisco, but I never get it here in time for my flight. Uh, do you understand this would cost you the price of a uniform, not the company? I understand. Hold on, I'll be right back. 
And he came back and said, my supervisor says you need to go down to the well-built uniform company on Fifth Avenue. They're our supplier. I'll call them and let them know you're on the way. They'll take care of you. Well, that's exactly what I wanted to know. So I went down to the well-built uniform company. Little fellow, Mr. Rosen, fitted me out in the uniform. Back then, there were black gabardine the three gold stripes on the arm, the gray hair. I certainly looked old enough to be the pilot. When it was all done, I said, how much do I owe you? Well, the uniform's $286. said, no problem, I'll write you a check. <laughs> no, um, we can't take any checks. Oh, well, then I'll, um, I'll just pay you cash. Oh, no, we can't accept cash. You need to fill out this computer card. Then in these boxes, put your employee number. Then we bill this back under uniform allowance. Comes out of your next Pan Am paycheck. Uh, that's even better. Go ahead and do that. <laughs> New York had two airports, LaGuardia and Kennedy. LaGuardia was 20 minutes from Manhattan. Kennedy was about 50, so naturally LaGuardia being the closer of the two, that's where I went. I spent most of the morning walking around LaGuardia in the uniform, trying to figure out now that I had the uniform, how the hell did you get on these planes? Well, I got a little hungry about lunchtime, so I walked in the luncheonette in the terminal, sat down at the counter on the stool, and ordered a sandwich. Moments later, a TWA crew walked in. The flight attendant sat in the booth, but the pilot sat at the counter on either side of me, captain right next to me. Back before deregulation of the airlines, airline people thought of themselves as just one big family. They didn't hesitate a moment to talk to each other, and the captain kind of leaned over. Hey, young man, how's Pan Am doing? Doing just fine, captain. Tell me, what's Pan Am doing out here at LaGuardia? Pan Am doesn't fly into LaGuardia, they only go into Kennedy. Well, I picked up on that right away. <laughs> yeah, we went into Kennedy, had a short labor, came over to visit some friends of mine. Matter of fact, I'm on my way back to Kennedy now. So tell me, young man, um, what type of equipment are you on? Now, airline people have a lot of jargon for things, and one of them is they refer to planes as planes as equipment, not aircraft, so I didn't know what that meant, what type of equipment was on. The only thing I could think of was a stool I was sitting on. So I said, oh, uh, I thought, had to do something with the planes. So I said, well, um, they had the wings, they had the engine. They also had a sticker on the engine, always who manufactured the engine. So I said, yes, General Electric. All three pilots kind of just stopped eating and leaned over. <laughs> Captain said, oh, really? What do you fly, washing machines? So I knew I said the wrong thing, out the door I went. <laughs> Everybody had an airline ID card, plastic, laminated card, much like a driver's license today, yet without the ID card, the uniform was worthless. I went back to Manhattan pretty discouraged, thinking, where would I come up with a Pan American Airline corporate ID? I was sitting in a hotel room. I noticed a big, thick Manhattan yellow page was on the dresser, so I pulled them down on the bed, flipped them open, and looked under the word identification. There were three or four pages of companies who made convention badges, metal badges, plastic badges, police badges, fire badges, started to call around, and finally one company said, listen, most of those airline IDs are manufactured by Polaroid. 3M company, need to go to one of them. Finally got the 3M company on the phone in Manhattan. Yeah, we manufacture Pan Am's identification system along with a number of other carriers. How come? So I tell you, I'm a purchasing officer for a major U.S. carrier. I'm in New York just for the afternoon. We're getting ready to expand our routes, hire a lot of new employees, go to a formal ID. We're very impressed with this Pan Am format. Wondered if I came by your office this afternoon briefly, we could discuss quantity and price. By all means, come on by. So I went by dressed in the suit, and the sales rep opened the book. Yeah, we do United, Delta, Eastern, Pan Am, Pan Am. Uh, we like this format. wonder if you might have a sample I could bring back. Sure, I'll be right back. And he brought me back a 5 by 7 glossy piece of paper with a picture of an ID card blown up in the middle of it. Someone else's picture in the picture, John Doe for a name, and in bold red ink across the front, this is a sample only. I said, no, I'm afraid this one, do you know, I need to bring back an actual physical card. And by the way, what is all this equipment on the floor? Oh, we don't just sell this card. We sell the system, camera, laminator. I say, we'd have to buy all of this. Absolutely. Well, tell you what, since we have to buy it all, why don't you just demonstrate how it works and use me? Fine, have a seat right here. <laughs> Took my picture, made up the card, and out the door I went. I was going down the elevator studying the card, had a little blue border across the top, about a quarter of an inch in Pan Am's color blue, but not a single thing on the card said Pan Am. No logo, no insignia, no company name. This was a plastic card, like a, a credit card. You couldn't type on it, you couldn't write on it, you couldn't print on it. Discouraged, I put it in my pocket, headed back to the hotel. As I was walking back, I noticed I had passed a hobby shop, so I turned around and walked back. 
Excuse me, sir. I see you sell a lot of models here. You sell models of commercial jetliners? Sure, over there. And I bought a model of a Pan Am 707 cargo jet for about $2.40, took it back to my room, opened the box, threw all the parts out. But there at the bottom of the box was a sheet of decals that went on the model. And the little sheet, when you dipped it in water, the Pan Am logo that would have went on the tail of the plastic plane went perfect up at the top of the plastic card. The word Pan Am and the special styling and graphics that would have went on the fuselage went perfect across the top of the card. And the clear decal on the laminated plastic made a beautiful identification card. Pan Am says they estimate that between the ages of 16 and 18, I flew more than a million miles for free, boarded more than 250 commercial aircraft in more than 26 countries around the world. Pan Am says keep in mind that though Frank Abagnale did in fact pose as one of our pilots, he never once stepped on board one of our aircraft. That's true, I never flew on Pan Am because I was afraid someone might say to me, you know I'm based in San Francisco, but I've never met you before. Or someone might say, you know your ID card is not exactly like my ID card. So instead, I flew on everyone else. If I wanted to go somewhere, I literally just walked out to the airport and looked on the board, United Flight 800 to Chicago. Then I went downstairs to the door marked United Operations and walked in. The operations clerk, hey Pan Am, what can we do for you? I was wondering if the jump seats open on 800 need to data to Chicago. Jump seat, it's open this evening, I'd like to get a pink slip pass. And I'd give my ID, he'd write me out a pass, I'd walk out, hand it to the flight attendant, She'd open the door to the cockpit and I'd step in. There had a captain, a co-pilot, a flight engineer, and a seat behind the captain called the jump seat where pilots deadhead on company time. Now because pilots love to talk shop, once you picked up all that jargon, it was the same conversation over and over and over. So I'd just step on board, even Jim Bob Davis be riding Chicago. On the taxi out, always the same question. So Bob, how long have you been with Pan Am? Been flying about seven years. What position do you fly? A uh, right seat, which was airline terminology for a Co-pilot, what type of equipment are you on? Had that one down, perfect. Matter of fact, whatever they flew, I didn't fly, so I had no problems with that. But arrive in Chicago, I'd go by the Pan Am ticket counter, but just enough to get the attention of the passenger service rep. So could I help you? Excuse me, uh, where do we lay over here? The dead at a trip or somebody got ill? Never laid over in Chicago. So we was at Parma House Hilton downtown. You need to catch the crew bus, lower level door three out. I'd go down the Parma House Hilton, walk in, and on the corner of the registration desk was a little sign that said, Airline Cruise. That was a three-ring binder. You just signed in, referenced your flight number, showed your ID. Pan Am would, the hotel would give me a key. Pan Am would be directly billed for my room and my meals. I also could write a personal check up to $100 at the front desk because I was an employee of the airline. The airline had a contract with the hotel, and they'd cash your check. But then I found out that every airline honors every other airline employee's personal check, a reciprocal agreement still practiced today in 2011. So at the Phoenix airport, a Delta flight attendant can walk up to the American airline ticket counter, show her Delta ID, and cash a personal check up to $100 and vice versa. Of course, when I found that out, I'd go out to JFK or LAX, only I'd go to everybody, Northeast, National, KLM, Air France. <laughs> It would take me a good eight hours, stopping at every counter and every building. By the time I got all the way around the other end of the airport, at least eight hours had gone by. And what do you have in eight hours? Shift change, new people, so I'd go all the way back around <laughs> the other way again. I made a great deal of money. The only reason I quit at 18 is the FBI issued a John Doe warrant for interstate transportation of fraudulent checks, a federal offense. The John Doe warrant meant the FBI didn't know my identity. In the warrant, the FBI said, based on interviews with people I had contact with, I was approximately 30 years old. I was 18, had a great deal of money, so I hung the uniform up and moved to Atlanta, Georgia. In Atlanta, I moved into a very swank singles complex that had just been built there called the Riverbend Apartments. On the application for the lease, there were a lot of questions for a teenage boy. One of them was occupation. I began to write down airline pilot, but the next question said employed by supervisor's name, telephone contact, I thought to myself, I'll need to come up with something that would be impossible to check out, yet something that would justify why I drive an expensive car, wear expensive clothes, don't work much. So I wrote down the word doctor. First thing came to my mind, nothing else. Had a very inquisitive apartment manager. Oh, I see here you're a doctor. Uh, yes, ma'am. What type of doctor are you? Well, I'm a, um, I'm a medical doctor. However, I'm uh, not practicing medicine right now. I left my practice out in Los Angeles to come to Atlanta to invest in some real estate, so I won't be practicing for a while. How interesting. Well, what type of medical doctor are you? And I figured, being a singles complex, pediatrician would be pretty safe. So I moved in, Dr. Frank Williams, pediatrician. 
Everybody call me doc, always the typical questions at the pool. So doc, where'd you go to medical school? Uh, Columbia University in New York. Where'd you serve your internship? At Harvard Children's Hospital out in LA. Once in a while when the guys would come by, hey Paul, hey Doc, look at my leg. I don't know what I did to it, look at this. Uh, Paul, I can't examine your leg. You need to go to your own doctor, have him look at that. When the girls came by, I always gave them a thorough examination, sent them on their way. <laughs> I was young, but not stupid. I was living there for about two or three months. One afternoon, there was a knock on the door, a very distinguished gentleman, mid 50 standing there. I said, I gotta help you. You are Dr. Williams? Yes. My name's Gordon. Just moved in the apartment down below. Wanted to come up and introduce myself. Ah, new neighbor, come on in. Well, I'm not only a new neighbor, I understand that you're a pediatrician. Yes, I'm the chief resident pediatrician of the county hospital up the street. Dr. Gordon was going through a divorce. He just separated from his wife. He was very upset, very lonely. Every day on the way to the car, he'd stop me. And after a minute or two about the weather, he'd start speaking medical terminology. Not being able to converse with him, I in turn would cut him short but I knew eventually he would get suspicious. Determined not to move, every day I went to Emory University's medical library. Every day I read the daily journals from Johns Hopkins from the Mayo Clinic. Every day I took a certain part of the journal, memorized it to detail, and every night when Dr. Gordon pulled in his parking slot, and this is every night without exaggeration now, I was sitting on his doorstep. Hey Doc, hear about this new theory they're using up at Mayo? What is it tonight? And I'd follow him into his apartment. Aggravated, he'd go in his bedroom to get undressed. I'd go in his bedroom, sit on the edge of the bed. Be in the kitchen, I'd follow him back and forth. Be in the bathroom, I'd talk through the door. Pretty soon he'd come home, hey doc, I don't have time to talk to you right now, I gotta go. Guy started to avoid me, which is exactly what I wanted. <laughs> One afternoon I received a call from the hospital administrator, who is not a physician, but the administrator of the hospital. Dr. Gordon suggested I give you a call, said you'd be more than happy to help us out. Uh, what's the problem? Uh, on the midnight date shift, I have a doctor supervise a number of interns, nurses on that ship. They've just been notified of a death in his family. He's returning to the West Coast tomorrow for about two weeks. And Georgia law requires a house doctor on duty be a full practitioner or a specialist. Dr. Gordon suggested you had a great deal of free time. You'd be more than happy to cover the shift in an administrative capacity. Uh, there's no way I could do that. Why not? Uh, I'm not licensed to practice medicine in the state of Georgia. Just the state of California where I hold my residency all the red tape for two weeks, uh, no red tape. We bring it before the medical review board tomorrow morning. They'll issue a temporary certificate. You can start tomorrow night. Now being one who hates to pass up a challenge, I couldn't help but give it a shot. So I went up to the hospital during the entire stay there. No one ever doubted for a second I was not a doctor. When the doctor returned, I was relieved from the hospital and left. I did pass the bar in the state of Louisiana, not in two weeks as the movie implies, but in two months by taking the two month prep course for the bar in Louisiana. At the time, actually, Louisiana did not require a law degree to take the bar. I passed the bar in Louisiana. I went to work for Attorney General P.F. Grimion in the civil division of his state court, where I spent about a year. No one the wiser, on my own, I resigned and left. A lot of people say, you know, it's not so much the people you impersonated as a teenage boy as it is the crimes you perpetrated as a teenage boy. Well, I did a lot of things that had just never been done before, so they got a lot of attention. I was walking down a Chicago street one day counting five $20 bills in my pocket. As I was counting them, I noticed I had passed the front door of a bank. There was a sign in the window that said, open a checking account. So I thought to myself, I'll go in this bank and open a checking account with this $100. I'll give them this phony Pan Am ID for identification. In two weeks, this bank will mail me 200 printed checks in a box with this name, with this ID, I'll cash them anywhere. So I walked in and opened the account. New accounts person came back. So here's a receipt for your $100. These are some temporary checks. We'll be mailing you your printed checks in about 10 days. Now being young, I was always inquisitive. So um, I noticed you didn't give me any deposit slips. No, sir, they come from the check printer. Be in the back of the checkbook, print with your name, your address, your account number. You get those in about 10 days. I see. I was just curious, you know, if I wanted to make a deposit tomorrow, next week, not a problem. You see the table in the lobby? Has all the forms on it? Just go over there and help yourself to a blank deposit slip. In this box, just write your account number in I gave you. Use those to get your printed ones. So I walked over, took a big stack of them off the shelf, went back to my hotel, couldn't sleep. Kept staring at them. So when the morning came, I went out and bought what was called the Burroughs 1000 magnetic encoder. 
looked like a big green calculating machine. And I magnetically encoded my account number the bank had signed me the day before to the bottom of every one of these blanks. I then went back, put them on the shelf in the lobby, and everyone who came in put their check directly in my account. <laughs> I was at the Logan Airport in Boston. I was trying to catch a flight. It was about a quarter to 12 at night. I ran out to the airport, but the whole airport was closing down. rent cars gift shops, ticket counters. So I walked up to the ticket counter. Uh, excuse me, you're closing the airport? Uh, actually, the airport lies in the heart of the city comes under the government's noise abatement control program. We have no jet operations till 6.30 in the morning. So I sat down wondering what to do. I noticed they were sticking all their cash and receipts in these big bank bags. Then they'd zip them closed, lock them, put them under their arm, and walk around the counter and down the hall to the bank that was in the terminal. They'd stick their key in the night box, open it, drop the bag down the chute, make sure it went all the way down, closed it, locked it, one right after the other, Hertz, Avis, Delta, Eastern, Dobbs House, dropping the bag. I didn't give this a lot of thought, but I came back to the airport the next night about a quarter to 12. I had rented a bank guard's uniform from a costume store in Boston, hung a beautiful sign over the night box, said, night box out of order, please leave all deposits with guard on duty. Everyone did. I was a nervous one sitting there going, how can a box be out of order? I mean, that's like a mailbox without an order sign. Of course, like any criminal, sooner or later you get caught, and I was no exception to that rule. I was arrested just once in my life at the age of 21 by the French police in a small town in southern France called Montpellier. The French police took me into custody on an Interpol warrant issued by the Swedish police. But when the French police took me into custody, they realized I had forged checks all over France, and they refused to honor the warrant from Sweden and the request for extradition. They later convicted me in France of forgery and sent me to French prison. I served my time in a place called the Maison d'Array, the house of arrest, in a small town in southern France called Pepignan. Steven Spielberg told Barbara Walters it was extremely important for me to go back to that prison, to the exact cell Frank was in, and reconstruct it according to the logbooks during his stay there, which he said was a blanket on the floor, a hole in the floor to go to the bathroom, no plumbing, no electricity. He said, I entered the prison at 198 pounds, and left the prison, according to the logbooks, at 109 pounds. When my sentence was over, I was extradited to Sweden, where I was convicted of forgery in a Swedish court of law and sentenced to a Swedish penitentiary. When my sentence was over in Sweden, federal authorities returned me to the United States. Arraigned in U.S. federal court, eventually a United States federal judge sentenced me to 12 years in federal prison. I served four of those 12 years at a federal prison in Petersburg, Virginia. When I was 26 years old, the government offered to take me out of prison on the condition I go to work for an agency of the federal government for the remainder of my sentence or until my parole had been satisfactorily completed. I agreed and was released. This year I'm celebrating 35 years with the FBI, where I work today and have worked for the last 35 years. I work out of headquarters in Washington, D.C. I make my home in Charleston, South Carolina, where I live with my wife of 34 years and my three sons. My youngest boy graduated from the University of Beijing in China. He's 27 years old. He went on to get his master's degree there. He reads, writes, and speaks Chinese fluently. He works for an American company in Beijing. My middle son graduated from the University of Nevada in Las Vegas with his degree in hotel administration. My wife owns a business in South Carolina. He manages that business for her. And my oldest son graduated from University of Kansas at KU. He went on to Loyola School of Law in Chicago, got his law degree, passed the bar in Illinois, went on to make his dad very, very proud. He's an FBI agent in our counterintelligence unit in Baltimore, Maryland. As many of you know, I had nothing to do with the film. Bureau restrictions did not allow me to make any profit or money from the film, from Broadway, from television, from books, or anything else. Uh, I had nothing to do with the film. I did feel that Steven Spielberg went out of his way to not glorify what I did, but to simply tell the story about what I did. In an interview with Barbara Walters, my best quote from him is when he said, I did not immortalize Frank Abagnale on film because of what he did 40 years ago as a teenage boy. I chose to immortalize him on film because of what he's done for his country for more than 30 years, unquote. In the end, my family and I were very pleased with the result of that film. But as you know, from there to television to Broadway, I get a lot of emails back in Washington, D.C. They never stop. The emails I get are come from children as young as eight years old to, children, to adults as old as 80. 
And of course, the people who send those emails are not really looking for a response, they just want to make a statement. Maybe they're seeing the film for the first time. Some write and say, you know, you were brilliant. You were an absolute genius. I was just a child. I wasn't brilliant. I wasn't a genius. I was just a child. Had I been brilliant, had I been a genius, I don't know that I would have found it necessary to break the law in order to just simply survive. And while there are people fascinated by what I did 40 years ago as a teenager, I've always looked upon what I did as something that was immoral, illegal, unethical, and a burden I live with every day of my life and will live with till my death. There are many who write and say you were very gifted, that I was. I was one of those few children that got to grow up with a daddy. The world is full of fathers. But I was one of those few children that was lucky enough to grow up with a person that you could call daddy, worthy of being called daddy. I had a daddy who loved his children more than he loved life itself. Steven Spielberg would say, the more I researched Frank's life without the use of Frank, I couldn't help but put his father into the film through the likes of Christopher Walken. My father was a man who had four children, three boys and a daughter. Every night at bedtime, he'd walk into your room. He was six foot three. He would drop down on a knee, kiss you on the cheek, and he'd put his lip up on your earlobe, and he'd whisper in your ear, I love you, I love you very much. He never missed a night. As I grew older, I sometimes fell asleep before he got home, but I always woke up the next morning, knew he had been by my bedside. Years later, my older brother joined me in my room. He was 6'4", in the Marine Corps. He went on to play semi-pro football for Buffalo. But when he was home, my father would walk around to his bed, hug him, kiss him, whisper in his ear he loved him. When I was 16 years old, I was just a child. All 16-year-olds are just children. As much as we like them to be adults, they're just children. And like all children, they need their mother, and they need their father. All children need their mother and their father. All children are entitled to their mother and their father. And though it is not popular to say so, divorce is a very devastating thing for a child to deal with and then have to deal with the rest of their natural life. For me, a complete stranger said I had to choose one parent over the other. There was no choice, so I ran. How can I tell you my life was glamorous? I cried myself to sleep till I was 19 years old. I spent every birthday, Christmas, Mother's Day, Father's Day in a hotel room somewhere in the world where people didn't even speak my language. And the only people that associated with me were people who believed me to be their peer, 10 years older than I actually was. I never got to go to a senior prom, a high school football game, or even share a relationship with someone my own age. I always knew I'd get caught. Only a fool would think otherwise. The law sometimes sleeps. The law never dies. It was just a matter of time. I was caught. I went to some very bad places. My boys have grown up asking their mother, why is it that dad wakes up in the middle of the night and goes down the TV room because he doesn't turn the TV on? He just sits there all night. Because there are things you can't forget, things you're not meant to forget. While I was sitting in that pitch black cell in France, my father, 57, was climbing the subway stairs in New York in great physical shape. He just happened to trip. He reached out to break his fall. He slipped, hit his head on a rail. By the time he landed at the bottom of the step, he was dead. I didn't know he was dead. I was sitting in that cell thinking about him, how much I couldn't wait to see him, hold him, hug him, kiss him, tell him how sorry I was, but I never got the opportunity to do that. I was very fortunate because I was brought up in a great country where everyone gets a second chance. I owe my country 800 times more than I could ever repay it for the opportunities it's given me these past 35 years. That is why I'm at the FBI today 26 years beyond my legal obligation to do so. I have turned down three pardons from three sitting presidents of the United States because I do not believe nor will I ever believe that a piece of paper is going to excuse my actions, that only in the end my actions will. 
I was very fortunate that 34 years ago on an undercover assignment in Houston, Texas, I met my wife. When the assignment was over, I broke protocol to tell her who I really was. Didn't have a dime to my name. I eventually asked her to marry me. Against the wishes of her parents, she did. Now I could sit up here and tell you that I was born again. I could tell you that prison rehabilitated me. Or I could take a cheap shot and just say that I was a kid who made some mistakes and grew up. But the truth is, God gave me a wife. She gave me three beautiful children. She gave me a family. And she changed my life. She and she alone. Everything I have, everything I've achieved, who I am today, is because of the love of a woman and the respect three boys have for their father, something I would never ever jeopardize. It comes a time in all of our lifetimes that we grow older and we have children. And as every parent knows, whether your child's three months old or 32 years old, when you lay your head on a pillow at night and you're just about to close your eyes, the last thing you think about, the last thing you worry about are your children. So if you still have your mother, you still have your father, you give him a hug. You give him a kiss. And to those men in the audience, both young and old, I'd remind you what it truly is to actually be a man. It has nothing to do with money, achievements, skills, accomplishments, degrees, positions. A real man loves his wife. A real man is faithful to his wife. And a real man next to God and country put his wife and children as the most important thing in his life. Steven Spielberg made a wonderful film, but I've done nothing greater, nothing more rewarding, nothing more worthwhile, nothing that's brought me more peace, more joy, more happiness, more content in my life than simply being a good husband, a good father, and what I strive to be every day in my life, a great daddy. It's been a pleasure. God bless you, and thanks for having me today. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Frank has agreed to take a few questions, so uh, let's do that. And we have a microphone out here, and you may ask anything you like, the movie uh, about crime, identity theft, or any questions you might have, I'd be happy to try to answer a few questions. Anyone? How did, how did you get a passport? Uh, back then, a airline crews traveled on what was called an international crew card. It was a little red card that kind of opened, and it was issued by the FAA. It had your photo in it and information about you. And rather than present passports as you go through countries, you presented your international crew card that allowed you to enter those countries as an active crew member on board an aircraft. And so I really didn't need to have a passport. And that was one of the things they couldn't understand how I was getting in and out of these countries, yet there was no record of any passport of having been issued. Uh, but I traveled on that international uh, crew card during all that time that I was uh, doing that. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, I, obviously, um, you know, things have changed. I went to the FBI 35 years ago after Hoover under Director Clarence Kelly, who followed Hoover. Uh, we had no cyber crime. We had no emails, computers, and laptops. And obviously, uh, crime has changed tremendously over the years that uh, I've been there. But there are always uh, people, obviously, smarter than you, sharper than you, do the things that are much more creative than you. Uh, so it's constantly trying to figure out how they do it. I've worked on all the cases, Enron, WorldCom, Tyco, Arthur Anderson, Madoff, uh, all of the high-profile cases. Uh, it's amazing how creative people can be when they want to be and uh, how unethical and how a uh, lack of character people can have uh, when it comes to wanting to uh, do some things that are considered illegal. So there is never any uh, lack of creativity. Uh, and certainly the technology that exists today that didn't exist when I did the things I did has made the crimes I did 40 years ago uh, 4,000 times easier to do today. Uh, I printed checks on a Heidelberg printing press. That's a million dollar printing press would just about fit in this room, 90 feet long, 18 feet high. 
ladders on the side of it to where I had to build scaffolding to get on the top of it so that I could operate it by myself. Color separations, negatives, plates, and typesetting. Uh, today it's done on a laptop in a matter of seconds uh, through graphics and creative printers, and etc. So the technology has made those crimes uh, a lot easier. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Can you tell us about it? Uh, in, in the movie, he used the name Call Henry. The real agent's name was Joseph Shea, S H S H E A. He and I were friends for over 30 years. He was my boss at the bureau for 10 of those uh, years. We've stayed friends until his death just a couple of years ago at the age of 88. Up until his death, he was sound of mind and great health. He was on the set during the making of the film, along with the two younger agents in the movie who are still living in their 70s. They're in Pennsylvania. Uh, they were on the set along with him. Uh, I've written five books on crime. My last book, Stealing Your Life, I dedicated that book to him and his memory of uh, my life with uh, him. He was an absolutely wonderful man. He has two daughters. One lives in Greenville, South Carolina, and one lives down in uh, Marietta, Georgia. Uh, we're very close to his daughters. We just took them to the Broadway play in New York with their family. And uh, I keep that relationship with his daughters and take care of them after he and his wife have passed away, but he was a wonderful man. He was an Irishman from Boston. He had a very heavy accent. Tom Hanks did an incredible job of playing him. Uh, he looked like him. He acted like him. He had his mannerisms. He did a wonderful job of portraying him in the uh, movie. He asked Steven Spielberg not to use his real name, so Tom Hanks came up with that name, which was based off an old football player that uh, Tom Hanks was a fan of, and he used his name in the uh, movie. Yes, sir. Frank, what was the total value of the illegal monies that you obtained? Uh, I was convicted on two and a half million dollars worth of fraudulent checks. Two million was recovered by the government that was in safe deposit boxes around the, uh, the country. Always keep in mind that would be equivalent to 20 million dollars today. Uh, that was a lot of money for a teenage boy, so only about a half a million of that money was spent. About 20 years ago, I repaid that half a million dollars, though there was no court order restitution in my sentence to do so. But I had three sons who expected me to do so, knew I could do so, and all of that money has been returned. No one is out any money from those crimes. The only one I didn't pay back was the hooker because I felt the lesson was well worth the money, so I didn't pay. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed you on uh, your you. speaking. I just wanted to know, the girl who was the subject um, when you were in the, working in the hospital, were you actually engaged to her? Did you go see her family in Louisiana? And then did you try and escape by going to um, a school to get a bunch of flight attendants? <laughs> that was, there were the few things when I look at the movie that when people ask me to analyze the movie and say, and I saw it in the theater like everybody else, but when the... <laughs> They asked me what was real and what wasn't. I, he changed very minor things. In real life, I had two brothers and a sister. He chose to portray me in the film as an only child. In real life, my mother never remarried. In the movie, he had her remarried. There was a little girl in the window at Christmas time uh, from her second marriage. That didn't exist. In real life, I was never engaged to anybody. I was just a teenage boy. I was way too young uh, to be engaged to the girls that I met who were all in their mid-20s. In real life, that was a Delta flight attendant whose father was the attorney general in Louisiana. And I met her, and through dating her, met her father, and that's how I ended up in Louisiana. He changed it around a little bit to be a candy striper in the uh, movie and meet the candy striper, and her dad was the attorney general. But there was no engagement. I was never actually engaged to that individual. It was just somebody that uh, I dated at the time. I escaped off the aircraft through the kitchen galley where they serviced the aircraft. In the movie, they said I escaped from the toilet. I was desperate, but I wasn't desperate enough to go down any toilets. So. But other than that, I thought he stayed uh, pretty close to the story. Any other? Yes? Uh, you have three wonderful kids, it sounds like. Thank you. And uh, how many grandchildren do you have? I have three grandchildren. The oldest boy has an eight-year-old daughter and a five-year-old son and a one-and-a-half-year-old daughter. Uh, my middle son just got married a couple of years ago, so they don't have any children yet. My youngest boy is 27 in China. He's single. Well, I was just curious what kind of vision you have for your, your grandchildren growing up in the tough world we have today. 
You know, I think that it's very important that what I see in, what I see in my life and my life's work uh, over the years is that, and I know that people are uncomfortable with this, but the truth is, the bottom line is, we live in an extremely unethical society. We live in a society that doesn't teach ethics at home. We live in a society that doesn't teach ethics in school. We live in a society where it is almost impossible to find a four-year college course on ethics. I've had three sons go to graduate school. Only the one that went to law school had a course on ethics. 48% of the nation's Fortune 500 companies don't have a code of conduct or a code of ethics. We live in a society now that's saying we should take the Pledge of Allegiance out of public school because there's no educational value to giving the Pledge of Allegiance in the morning in school. When you look back at Enrons and WorldComs and Wall Street and Madoff and all of these crimes, it all comes down to one thing. They had the best of families, they had the best of educations, but they lacked character and, and ethics. Their parents did not instill in them the two most important things in life, character and ethics. And when they became adults, they felt it was not wrong to steal, manipulate, or deceive people. And until we wake up to the fact that crime is only going to get easier, technology breeds crime, it always has, it always will, crime has become more global. Until we wake up to the fact that we have to bring character and ethics back into our homes, back into our schools, back into our business life, back into our uh, uh, universities, uh, nothing's going to change. Now, this has nothing to do with religion. This has to do with character and ethics. And it's the job of a parent to instill in their children proper character and ethics. And that's a constant thing. Son, you didn't hold the door for that lady. Why didn't you hold the door for her? You need to hold the door for a lady when she goes through the door. Uh, son, you gave the girl a $10 bill. She thought it was a 20. You're going to drive away and let her think she gave you the proper change. Are you going to go back and give her the money back? Those were things I came across with my own sons that I had to keep re-instilling them, but they kept getting it over and over so that when they grow up, they learn to hold the door for a woman, they learn about manners, they learn about being, uh, having character in their life and how important that is, and having ethical behavior in their life. And that's the thing that's lacking in our society today. We've gotten so busy in our own lives that we're not instilling in our children the things our parents instilled in us about character and ethics. And until we change it around, Unfortunately, um, we're not going to see a dent. I know you heard about all these figures, $700 billion stimulus fund, another $440 billion for another fund, $200 billion for Katrina, drop in the bucket to white collar crime in America now at $998 billion a year, almost a trillion dollars, just white collar crime alone. For every dollar you spend out of $10 in health care, a dollar goes out the door to fraud. $300 billion in Medicare fraud last year. That is absurd. That all comes from unethical uh, behavior by people who lack that character and ethics. And uh, that's not going to change by changing policies. It's only going to change by a long process of uh, bringing that into schools and uh, back into people's lives. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Frank, you've talked about identity theft here at our table. Would you share some of your thoughts? Yeah, Danny, Danny, I've written three books on identity theft. It's an amazing crime. We have 15 million victims a year now, $62 billion in annual losses from identity theft. It's hard to be in a room with two or three people where one person says, uh, I happened to me, happened to my brother. So very simple. Uh, I would only ask you to do what I do, and then you can wipe that from your concern. One, I own a shredder. I shred everything, because what you believe to be worthless is of great value to someone else. So you got a Nordstrom's catalog yesterday with the fall shoe collection. You looked at it, you didn't like the shoes, you threw the catalog away. On the back cover was your source code, your ID number, and your address. That's all I need to become you. What you think is worthless is of great value to someone else. The problem is there are three types of shredders. Two are worthless. One's called a straight shredder, called a ribbon shredder. Uh, when you shred on that, we can put that information back together in less than eight hours. Some of you use crisscross shredders, or, which are called diamond cut shredders we can put those back, as we did in Enron and WorldCom and Arthur Anderson. Even though the auditor shredded it, we put it all back together and read it. Uh, you put a credit card in there, it's only able to slice it in four slices, so you just put the slices back and you read everything that was on the credit card, including the signature panel, etc. So when you go out to buy a shredder, and they're all the same price, you need to make sure you look on the box that it says Micro Cut Shredder. Those are the shredders we use at a bureau. That turns paper into confetti. And they're all basically the same price. But unless it says micro-cut, it's not really a valuable tool. Uh, look for a credit monitoring service. There are hundreds of them. 
You have to vet those services. Some of them are actually Ponzi scams. Some are victimizing the victim. Uh, I use one called Privacy Guard. It's the oldest and the largest, and I've used it since the early 90s. If you bank at any of the 10 of the, large, 10 of the 12 largest banks in the United States by asset or American Express, and you use their credit monitoring service, that's Privacy Guard. Uh, Wells Fargo may have given it a different name for marketing purposes, but it's Privacy Guard. Privacy Guard does two very important things. It monitors your credit 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and notifies you in real time. Not by letter, not by email, not by some uh, quarterly, ask, quarterly note. So if someone's in Macy's right now applying for credit under your name, your cell phone's going to go off. And you have a direct line into that Macy's to find out why they're checking your credit. And that's the kind of credit monitoring service you want to use. And finally, I don't write a lot of checks in today's environment. If I uh, walk into CVS or Walgreens and write a check for $8, on the check is my name and address and phone number, my bank's name and address, my account number at my bank, my routing number into my account, my signature that's on my signature card at my bank, and then the CVS clerk wrote my license number and my date of birth. Because we live in what's called truncation, we don't get the check back. The physical check goes to CVS's warehouse in Brooklyn, which is unsecured, and sits there for 90 days or 120 days. Anyone who sees that check from the clerk who took it and writes it on a postum and puts it back in the register to the night deposit clerk all the way down the line actually can draft on your bank account the next day and rob you blind based on the information on your face of your check, just like drafting on your account. And God forbid you wrote that check at your grocery store or your CVS store on a money market account, a wealth management account, or some account in which you have a large sum of fun funds in that particular account. So I don't get over paranoid. I write a check to pay my mortgage, write a check to pay my insurance company, write a check to pay the credit card company, but I am uh, very cautious about writing checks in today's environment. I don't have a debit card. I've never owned a debit card. I've never allowed my children to have a debit card, and I've written many times in the Wall Street Journal and Fortune and other magazines that it is the worst financial tool ever given to the American consumer. I remove from my life every day 99.9% .9 of all my risk because I use the safest form of payment that exists on the face of the earth, and that is a credit card. Credit card. American Express, Visa, MasterCard, Discover. Every day of my life I spend their money. I never spend my money, so my money can never be at risk because my money is sitting in a money market account earning interest, and every day I spend their money. I go to the grocery store, credit card. Pick up my dry cleaning, credit card. Get on the plane, credit card. Go to the hotel, credit card. Get the rent a car, credit card. Every day I'm spending their money while my money earns interest. Should someone look over my shoulder, get my number, create a card, and steal $1 million on my account by federal statutes, my liability is zero. I have zero liability. If I go in the store and I buy a vase at Tiffany's and they go, now if you really like this $2,500 vase, I have one gift wrapped in the back all boxed up. I'll take that one. I go home, has a crack in it. I go back to the store, look, I got this home, had a big crack in the bottom of the vase. You must have dropped it. No, I didn't drop it. It was in there. Well, I can't give you money back. Now I have to sue them in small claims court. I use my credit card, uh, no problem. When I get the credit charge, I'll just dispute that charge. I'll take it up with Visa. Not a problem. When you use your debit card, you're exposing your money. Your money is out every day and you're using your money. If someone takes your money, you're going to have to negotiate your money back from the bank. We had an incident with TJ Maxx, 45 million credit cards stolen, $150 million in losses. Everyone who had a debit card waited three months to get their money back in their checking account. Everyone who had a credit card got their new card the next day or ten, within 10 days in the mail and went on about their business. When you use a debit card, you do nothing for your credit. You don't raise your credit score by one point. So we have a lot of young people off at college. They spend four years there on a debit card. They come out, want to rent an apartment, buy a car. They have no credit because all they have is a debit card. And you don't obviously get points from airlines and whatever. So when my three sons went off to school, I said, I'm not giving you a debit card. I'm giving you a supplemental card off my credit card. So for all practical purposes, it's your card. It has your name on it. But the bill comes to me, and I'm responsible for the bill. I do this for two reasons. One, so I see how you're spending your money. If you're spending a lot of time in a bar, I'm going to know it. And two, every day, every month I pay the bill, your credit score goes up. So when you come out of college, the one thing I personally guarantee you, your credit score will be in the high 700s. 
you'll be able to buy your own car, buy your own house, you'll be able to do what you need to do without me having to co-sign. My oldest son, who went to four years of college and three years of law school, went to the FBI, his first city assignment, Baltimore. He's where all my sons were raised in Oklahoma. So he moved to a place where the homes were five times the prices of the homes in Oklahoma. He had a wife and children. He would have never been able to buy his house, except he had incredible credit, because I had paid the credit card bill on time, all the time, which affected what we call piggybacking onto his credit card account. And he ended up with a great credit score and was able to do that. There's nothing better you can do for your child than to build credit for them while they're away at school. Uh, a debit card is something that I, I wouldn't recommend anyone use. A credit card still remains the safest form of payment because it removes all liability uh, from you. We're about time. We've got one more question. Yeah, one more question. Yes. Anyone? I think we've got everybody. Oh, yes, sir. You talk a lot about the concerns with writing a check and information. What's your take on everybody just releasing all their personal information on Facebook, social media, and how that impacts their financial future, if uh, you will? Very, um, I've written a lot about Facebook. Um, I'm not on Facebook, obviously, and uh, my sons are. Um, that's a social a networking system. So far, we have about um, 10 million children on uh, Facebook. We have on um, Facebook. We have about 3 million children on Facebook that are under the age of 10 years old. Um, uh, when they go on Facebook, not only do they post their picture, they post their date of birth, they post the state, the city they were born, and where their place of birth is. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of information on there. Um, I don't know. Most people are just not aware of the technology. We have a, pro uh, a software program called Pathmark that allows me to be in the airport on the iPhone and I see you. I don't know you from Adam. I just see you standing across the way in the airport, so I hold up my phone and I take your picture. Within seven seconds, that will take me to Facebook and it will match multi-millions of faces under facial recognition and tell me exactly who you are. So the first thing that pops up in seven seconds is your Facebook page. And on your Facebook page, I see your picture and I go, yeah, that's them, that's the match. And then it tells me the date of birth you had and it tells me where you were born. So for, to me to gather information about you would be very simple from that point on. It's that simple to do. If your child's on Facebook and have a cell phone through a software program called Creeper, which is not very expensive and sold online, I can actually pull your child's face up on Facebook and within a matter of three or four seconds tell you where your child is at that one second right now. Are they walking out of the schoolroom? Are they getting in a car? Are they standing by a mailbox? Where is that mailbox exactly where they are? So, I have no problem if people want to get on Facebook, but there are two rules. One, you don't put your picture. Two, you never put your date of birth, and you don't put where you were born on, on Facebook. There's no reason for anyone to know that. Second is stop making statements on Facebook that are going to come back and haunt you. We have a 14-year-old, for example, gets on Facebook and says, I love the Nazis. I'm a big fan of the Nazis. I'm all about the Nazis. He's 14 years old. He doesn't know what he's saying. Five years later, he replies to the University of Arizona and says, denied, because they went on to Facebook and saw that he loved Nazis. He applied for a job at Jacobs Engineering, denied, because they saw he loved Nazis. There is no rationalization of, well, that was when he was 14 years old. He probably didn't know what he was saying. He's 23 now. They don't care about that. They only care about history. So I try to tell young people, when you get on Facebook, you need to be very careful what you say knowing that that's going to be used for years from years from now when people review to look at you, whether it be a job, whether it be for credit, whether it be for insurance, whether it be for anything else. So you have to use those social websites in a very, a very, very careful way. You've got to be a little smarter, a little wiser. But please do not doubt the simple technology that's available today that can do some amazing uh, things. If I say to you on the phone, I need the last four digits of your social security number, and you say, sure, 9108, and then in the conversation, I say to you, so I notice you have a real southern accent. Uh, you from the South Carolina? Uh, no, actually born and raised in Florida. Oh, in Florida, yeah. You know, you kind of sound like you're my age. I'm, I'm 53. Uh, no, I'm, uh, I'm just 28. Well, you told them the year you were born, the state you were born in, and all they have to do, that's the first three digits of your Social Security number. That represents in a combination your date of birth and your Social Security and the state you were born in where it was issued. Uh, we already have the last four digits, so all we've got to do is take those two digits, 99 digits, to a simple min uh, computer program to make a perfect match to you. 
And finally, I would just add this before I leave. There are only five incidences required by federal law where you have to give your Social Security number. They're pretty common to the Internal Revenue Service, to financial institutions where you're opening a bank account, you have a loan, you're conducting business with that institution, to any law enforcement agency, federal, county, state, to any government agencies, municipalities, federal, county, state, villages, etc. And finally, of course, for the purpose of Medicare and Medicare for health care purposes. That's it. So when you go rent a storage unit and you pay in advance, why are you giving them your Social Security number? When you join the gym and you paid in advance for six months and you showed them your driver's license to prove you're that person signing up in the gym and you gave them your credit card, why would you give them your Social Security number? Even when you go to the doctor's office, why would you give them your Social Security number? Are the, is the doctor billing you? Are you setting up a credit account with the doctor? Because if you have insurance and you're paying a copay, then the doctor has no reason to have your Social Security number. If you're a little aggressive and you say, you know what, I'm not giving you that number. The law says I'm not required to give you that number and I'm not giving you this number, no, no reason. The only way we're going to start the proliferation of numbers is to stop giving that number out. The law limits the use of that number. We're the ones that keep handing it out just because people ask us for it. Uh, we've got to be real careful about uh, controlling our own number if we want to control our identity. And your identity is really the only one thing uh, you have left. Finally, I do have a website. It's just my name, abignail.com. I sell no products. I provide no services. It is strictly an educational site. So if you go there, off the home page is a button marked Publications. You can go and download all the things I write about how to protect your family from identity theft, how to protect your company from embezzlement, if you're worried about check forgery. All those things, you can just click that button, download those, print those pages out. And if you have any questions, you may email your questions through my website. They will go directly to me, and I will try to answer them with and usually within a few days. So if you have a question about something, is it safe to bank online? Is it safe to bill pay? Am I doing this properly? Uh, just send your email. It is just my last name, which is in your program, .com. That will take you to that website. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure being with you. Thank you. Frank, thank you ever so much. Outstanding. We have a small present for you. Again, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, best of luck to thank you. you.